So we are very happy to today to have the event for uh, the price, the junior research price of the score PSC chair on uh, macroeconomic risk. So I'll let Philippe Trenard quickly introduce the price and then uh, Gilles will say a few words. Okay, thank you so much, Axel. Uh, I have to confess that we are very happy to work with the by School of Economics share. The, the, the foundation is, of course, uh, supporting this share because of our foundation is dedicated to scientific research and to research on risk, of course, on insurance, if it is possible. But our main focus, because economics has a lot to say on risk, the economics of risk is really an area which is uh, which has been developing uh, a lot of uh, of research and uh, and a lot of results, and uh, we are happy to connect macroeconomics to risk because when we are looking, for example, for internal models, of course the connection between both is absolutely key, as key as in the banking sector, and and therefore we are very happy. Uh, also of this price and the fact that we uh, that uh, the share is supporting young research on on risk which is exactly going in the kind of direction we want uh, to support and at the end of the game i have to say that uh, us at uh, at score and all the people who are working at score are looking at uh, the, the, the the analysis and uh, even the theoretical development in order to know how much it could influence our approach of uh, the macroeconomic consequences on uh, on insurance and reinsurance. So I am very happy and I congratulate you, but leave the floor to Gilles, who is much more competent than me on uh, on economics and on, on seeing what uh, what is the meaning of the price and the, and the price of this year? Thank you very much, and congratulations to you, Jan. Thank you. Okay, well, it's a, it's a pleasure for me to to introduce you, uh, Jan. Uh, you are almost at the age limit uh, for uh, being eligible for the price, but the good side of it is that you have numerous, you have papers published uh, in uh, very good journals. And many of them are about risk. Uh, I think it's fair to say that your work is at uh, the intersection between uh, finance and, and macro, uh, maybe, uh, maybe a, lot of, a, a lot of finance. Uh, you, you graduated uh, from Harvard, and then uh, I think after a brief passage, a brief uh, stay at Duke, you made most of your career so far, your young, Career to at um, Northwestern. Uh, so, so today you are going to present a paper that we find that Axel and, and I found uh, very interesting, which uh, tells us what happens to an economy uh, which is organized in a network. It's a, it's a field of research that has been very active in the last uh, couple of decades. Uh, uh, people have been opening the black box. Uh, of the macroeconomy and try to see uh, uh, to, to establish predictions about um, the interplay between the network structure of the economy and its aggregate uh, behavior. Uh, actually, the, the first prize was given to uh, Mariam Farboudi, who, who was also working on networks, but more uh, about credit networks. Uh, and um, in this uh, in this paper that you are going to, to present. When we open the black box, we see that uh, it matters for, if I understood correctly, of course, uh, my understanding will be better at the end of your presentation. It matters for uh, the response of the economy to large aggregate shocks, how the network is organized, uh, how are the nodes um, organized. And uh, one key result is that the response to, to large shocks um, it's quite different to the response to small shocks, if I remember correctly. So um, thank you for accepting our prize and for giving this presentation. We are very eager to, to, to hear your presentation and the floor is yours. Uh, 
I, well, the floor is excels with, you know, sharing the session, but essentially yours. Exactly. Thanks. So you have 45 minutes to present and then we'll take uh, questions and we do not see your slides. Okay, they should be coming right now. There we go. Um, uh, okay, so thank you. Thank you so much for this reward for this uh, for this award for, for for reading my paper um, and for having me and for coming. Um, I'm, I, I, don't, I like this paper. Um, I, I enjoyed working on this paper. And so I'm, I'm excited to, to talk about it. And so the you know, the, the goal is to think about systemic risk, is to think about, you know, we have this idea that some sectors or, you know, some institutions for that matter, some firms, some banks are systemically important, right? Which is to say that we think that shocks to certain sectors, to certain firms might have global effects on the economy, might affect the entire economy instead of just having local effects exactly where they're they're located. And that's what we want to try to understand. We want to try to understand in this paper how what determines that, what causes a shock to a given sector to propagate through the entire economy. And so, for example, you could ask what happens if the supply of some good is seriously restricted, right? So we see restrictions on energy supply, right? Like Europe has been working through that recently. After COVID, there were uh, lots of supply chain problems. Semiconductors were a, a prominent one. And so if you reduce the supply of semiconductors, you re reduce the supply of energy, how does that propagate through the economy? Or you could even go further and say, what happens if we entirely shut down certain sectors, right? So again, during COVID, we were shutting down entire things. We were shutting, you know, the entire restaurant sector would shut down. Movie theaters were gone. Uh, transportation fell significantly. What does that do to the economy? And so the, the contribution of this paper is going to be to study the effects of those sorts of shocks, really these explicitly large shocks in a nonlinear production network. And so there are kind of two things that are happening here. One is we want to think about large versus small, right? So typically we would do a local approximation, maybe like a perturbation or a Taylor series where you're, you know, formally you're relying on the shocks being local to zero, here, I want to think about the shocks actually the other direction, all the way off to infinity. And why that matters is, is or where it's going to matter is when we think that there's nonlinearity in the economy, right? If everything was linear, then large and small shocks are the same. It's precisely the fact that things might be nonlinear, that the response of the economy might change as the shocks get larger. That's where you need to start actually capturing this nonlinearity in your, in your analysis. And so there are lots of examples of this. Energy tends to be where we get the biggest movements in prices. So U.S. oil prices jumped by a factor of three between 2000 and 2001. Natural gas prices in Europe were up by a factor of 50 between 2020 and their peak in 2022. During COVID, expenditures in the U.S. on air transportation fell by 96%, 43% for vehicle purchases, and 33% for healthcare. So these are big, big shocks. Right. And this is really only going back the last couple of decades. You look in other countries, you look further back, and you can find a lot of other similar events. And then again, at the start of COVID, governments had to decide what sectors do we want to shut down versus what do we need to leave open? Right. That I think we kind of intuitively understood we want to leave the utilities open, but then you had things like law firms where it's a little less clear. Certainly the police stayed open, but then, you know, restaurants, not so much, but probably grocery stores. So how do we think through those, those choices of what do we leave open versus shut down and what are the consequences of those choices going to be? And so there certainly is work on this, right? Especially in the, the networks literature, there's work on understanding what makes a sector important. And the standard measure of influence is called the DOMAR weight, which is really just the sales shares, the total sales of the sector divided by nominal GDP. And so we just say a sector is influential if it sells a lot, if it's big. And what I'm plotting here on the left are the DOMAR weights or those sales shares in the US for hospitals and computers between 1963 and 2020. And so what you see is they were pretty similar between the 60s and the late 90s. So computers and hospitals were go both getting progressively more important and then subsequent to that, computers actually, their sales have dropped off. Nominal sales have fallen, really just because prices have come down so much. Whereas the share of expenditures on hospitals has been rising progressively and it's kept going up. And so by that analysis, by the standard analysis, we would conclude that hospitals are now 
way, way more important than computers. And in addition, that computers are no more important than they were 60 years ago in 1963, that they've fallen back to where they were at the start. And I don't think that sounds right. And I want to try to think through why that might not be right. And where the paper is ultimately going to go is it's going to argue that the really the right-hand side of this figure is more important. This is plotting the fraction of sectors downstream that are using these two commodities. So what does that mean? It means when you're producing your output, are you using computers or are you using hospital services as an input directly? Nobody uses hospital services. The only reason you even get anything off of zero here at the end is you're getting nursing homes. Nursing homes use hospital services as an input. Nobody else does. Computers, this is not, so if, you know, if it was anybody that uses computers, you'd be at 100%. You're not. You're at around like 55% by the end. So what is that? This is who is using computers as a material input to produce their output, right? So this is saying, if you make a refrigerator, there's a computer in the refrigerator. If you make a car, there's a computer in the car. There's a computer in lots of stuff at this point. And so we, uh, what we observe then is that computers are used as a direct input not just as a capital good, but actually as a material input in the production of you know, almost everything in the economy. That other 45%, that's largely services. And so what I'm going to argue is that that, that is actually more important. Sorry, please. Isn't the blue line the fraction of refrigerators that have a hospital inside? Yes, exactly. Really? So, so it's close to zero, basically, right? Right. Nobody has, a, exactly. That's exactly the point. Nobody has a hospital inside. Again, nursing homes are the only, nursing homes so do. These are not right? hospital, hospital services. Inside. These are neither hospital services nor computer services. The uh, Sorry, say that again. These are neither hospital services nor computer services. The people these who are need. hospitals and computers. Yeah, so I'm plotting who is using them, fraction, what fraction of sectors downstream is using the commodity. Right. But the commodity being the hospital itself, not its Precisely. services. <clears throat> it's pre the, the commodity being the services. So who's using hospital? So somebody is using hospital services as a material input to produce their output. So you are comparing <laughs> hospital services with computers uh, as such, no? Correct. Yes. But if you if it were computer services, it would be 100%, basically. Yes, absolutely. And so the way that's getting calculated in the data here is that's that those other computer services are showing up as um, really as an investment good. You're seeing the like their those computer services that are 100%. They're getting they're showing up just because people already own the computers. And so on some level, I agree. Like it realistically, it should be 100%. One way to think about it is if I shut down computer production today, we would still have our computers. And so we could still kind of, the services, the service flow, we would still get for a while, but I need a computer inside the car and I can't make a new car. And so that's that 55% is kind of, if I, if I told you there are no more computers, the 55% is what stops immediately. Whereas that other 45% that's computer services, that would keep going. Uh, you know, until those computers depreciate and break and, and everything and go away. So if I, if I may, just a question. So couldn't we, so if you consider hospital or more generally the uh, health sector, so if you think of labor as an input, okay? So actually, I mean, it's productivity is kind of uh, um, correlated with the expenses in hospital and health. So maybe the right way to measure, I mean, hospitals is more as the expenses that active people are making. Uh, Absolutely. So I, the one way to think about that is that what this paper is going to measure is the supply chain impacts, the direct supply chain impacts of a shock to a given sector. There are going to be, there are lots of other reasons why hospitals are important. So like, you, so one, they're just intrinsically important, right? We don't want the hospitals to shut down, right? We want those, like we value hospital services highly intrinsically just to keep people alive. Two, as you say, they will affect labor supply. And so that'll have dynamic effects on the economy. And you could say the same with restaurants, right? So restaurants are really upstream of nothing. But one concern in the US when they were shutting restaurants down was that you're then reducing the wages of all of those employees, those wages, those people then don't buy things and that becomes a demand shock and that might have effects. And this is gonna shut all of those sorts of things down 
and focus very much just on really the supply chain channel here. And the one another way to say that is that these domar weights are folk are also derived in like a supply chain sort of framework and not thinking about the effects on on labor supply either. So the basic contribution is going to be to study the effects of, again, large shocks in a nonlinear production network. The way this is going to work is I'm going to show you an asymptotic approximation for GDP. So instead of a local approximation where the shocks are small, I'm going to show you the first order behavior of GDP with respect to large shocks, really taking them off to infinity. So we're going to get guaranteed convergence as the shocks grow large, but still the economy is actually going to be kind of like quasi-linear. You'll see how the linearity shows up, and you'll, I'll, I'll show you some figures that help understand that. So what do we get? The uh, measure of a, of a sector systemic risk, I'll show you, is going to depend on, and there's a reason I was showing you that plot, it's going to depend on the fraction of GDP that is downstream of that sector and that cannot substitute away from it. So the canonical example of this, and this has been discussed in the literature, is comparing electricity to restaurants. That they're similar size sectors and domar weights, but there's this, you know, intuitively, I think we understand that if you shut off electricity, everything stops, right? Those, all the computers turn off. We can't really do anything. The lights are off and the machines don't function. Whereas restaurants, if we shut restaurants down, everything else keeps operating fine. You just can't go out to dinner. You have to cook at home. The model is going to formalize that idea and kind of show where it comes from and show more generally what it implies. One of the core things that it implies is that the steady state size of a sector is not actually relevant. That is not going to determine what its importance is when its shocks are very large. And in fact, more generally, many of the parameters in the model will not appear. They are not going to actually matter in uh, driving the results. And so we're going to get this very deep invariance that's going to show up and you'll you'll see it because the parameters just don't appear in the uh, in the formulas. That invariance is actually useful. It makes it easier to measure things in the data. So typically you need huge numbers of parameters. There are all these elasticities you need to estimate. I'm gonna show that to get these first order tail effects, to understand systemic importance in the tail, you actually don't need to know the exact values of all the parameters. And so it makes measurement much easier. I'll then talk a bit, the paper goes into this more. I'll talk a bit about how this determines tail risk and GDP overall. An example I'll show you in the in the, the slides is that a new invention can simultaneously diversify the economy and might even reduce the local risk of the economy, but at the same time increase tail risk. So in terms of literature, this is building on certainly on all the work on production networks. So think about like Long and Plosser, but also you can go back to Leontief. Um, more recently, there's a lot of work. So Bekai and Farhi is one of the most important. Um, Emmanuel was, was one of my advisors. They uh, Their work is thinking about nonlinearity, and I'll, they were thinking in a local sense. And again, that's going to be distinguished from what I'm doing here with the tails. Um, a lot of this is empirical work on large shocks in production networks. There's not a ton of theory. More generally, there is there's certainly work on crashes, on disasters, on asymmetries in the economy, and this this fits into that that kind of literature. And so I'll talk about how this is going to naturally generate asymmetry in the economy's responses to large negative shocks versus large positive shocks. Okay, and so with that, um, let me talk about the uh, the structure of the economy. So the the model is kind of both complicated and simple at the same time, what we have is really just N sectors that are that all have the same basic structure, but with different potentially different parameters. So every sector, sector I, produces output, YI, has productivity, ZI. That's going to be important. It uses labor, L. It's going to turn out not to matter. And it has the CES aggregate over its material inputs. So sector I is buying goods from sector J, uses a quantity XIJ of them. And there's a weight on good J of AIJ, so that can differ across sectors, and an elasticity of substitution, sigma I. And so sigma I is going to determine how easy is it for sector I to substitute across goods. That is going to matter a lot. I'm going to give the consumer Cobb-Douglas utility. 
technically that's without loss of generality, but I think really like economically, what this is going to do is again, focus things on the supply chain. And so that's what we're going to be thinking about is really the supply side of the economy here. We then have a resource constraint that says that the output of good I can go either to inputs used by other sectors or to final consumption. And the final consumption has these weights, beta I, those are going to matter too. So the beta, the sigma is going to show up, the A is going to matter, and the Zs will matter, those shocks. But this is the whole model. This is actually it. Everything gets onto one slide and you just do this end times. You can solve it either via a social planner or a competitive equilibrium. I'll do that, uh, but the economy is efficient, so it makes no difference. So how do you analyze this? You want to think about the first order conditions, right? You want to stack those. Really, you can express that as a cost minimization problem. And so that's this equation. This equation is kind of the center of everything. So we're taking logs here. We're looking at the log price of good I. It depends on sectorized productivity, right? If sectorized productivity goes up, that reduces its price directly. So that's the ZI term. And it also depends on the cost of all the inputs that sector I purchases, right? So if all of my inputs get more expensive, all these PIJ, PJs go up, that increases my price. So PI will go up. So PI depends on upstream prices. That means shocks then propagate downstream, but in a nonlinear way, right? Through that, through this kind of messy nonlinear transformation. So the, that the, is what makes the, this hard. That's what, in fact, makes this not in general solvable by hand. So the network is AIJ essentially. Correct. All the network, basically the the links between the sectors are represented by the AIJs. So it's like long and plosser essentially. Exactly. This is long and plosser. The uh, elasticity of substitution is not necessarily one, so you're not necessarily in a Cobb Douglas world, and so that'll mean that the so AI the AIJs then are not sufficient statistics. You can't just look at that matrix. The sigmas also impact how, how you substitute. So under Cobb-Douglas, you substitute kind of linearly. A sigma different from one makes that nonlinear. But you can see the AIJs are going to matter for propagation, right? That if I shock sector J, but AIJ is equal to zero, then that does not directly impact sector I. If I knew the prices, if I could figure all of those out, right, as a function, so ideally what you want to do is solve this equation, right? You get a vector of productivities that's kind of, that's exogenous. And you say, well, if I have that vector, I need to solve this system. And if I could do that, if I knew the solution to the system, I immediately get GDP just as minus beta prime times the vector of prices. And this comes really just because we've normalized the wage, the wage and labor to one. So the way what's happening here is you get a shock to sector I. So say productivity in sector I goes up, that reduces prices in sector I, that directly affects GDP through this beta I. It also propagates downstream through the network, which happens in Long and Plosser and every other network model. And we're just trying to trace out exactly how that works. So what I want to do is think about large shocks here. So we're going to take a vector. We're going to put the productivities into a vector. So I'm going to have this vector Z, which is just stacked up all my productivities. And I'm going to give that a polar representation. So you can always do this. There's a unique representation that I put Z in the form theta T. Those theta, theta and T are both going to matter here. Theta lives on the unit sphere, right? So it's just a unit length vector giving me a direction in productivity space. So theta is telling me what's the combination of shocks that I got, right? I could get a positive shock just to one sector, positive shocks to many sectors. I could have a positive shock to one sector, negative shock to another one, whatever combination you want. That's your theta. And then T is how big is the shock, right? So T gives you the scale. So theta is a scenario. T is how extreme it is. A positive shock to one sector would just put a one as as a single element of the theta, a negative shock to that same sector is not a negative T. This is going to matter. It's a minus one for that element of theta. I could have a positive aggregate shock. Negative aggregate shock would be minus theta. Again, whatever you want. So we're going to write everything in terms of theta and T. 
And the tool, really the result, the main result in the paper that drives everything is that prices have linear asymptotes. So what does that mean? There are unique functions, mu i of theta and phi i of theta. That's the constant and the, and the slope in this linear function, such that as t goes to infinity, the log price of good i really is a function of theta, converges to a linear function of t, right? So if t goes up by one, that log price is going to move by phi i of theta times that t. So phi i is my slope. So it's telling me asymptotically as the, as the scale of this shock gets big, how does this shock affect the price of good i? Right, and I'm gonna get one of those for every single sector. So I can understand that and the vector of phi is gonna tell me how does each sector's price respond to this shock, this combination of productivity shocks to different sectors. And why is it that if t is equal to zero, you get uh, something? Um, uh, let me show you, I, I think a figure will help understand that. So let me show you that in just a moment. Um, it's a good, it's a very good question. So you'll see that. In, in, let me show you that on the next slide. So first though, let me talk about the, the slopes. So the slopes, what determines the response of prices in sector I to, uh, to this shock as T gets big? Again, it's really the same. It's the same basic recursion, right? So my price, PI, depends on, remember, minus productivity. So you're just seeing the minus theta here, right? Because it's just the price scaled by T. So I still, when productivity is rising in, in my sector, in sector I, that reduces my price. In addition, I depend on the prices of the goods upstream. But what matters now is not that nonlinear recursion. What matters is if they, if sigma is less than one, so if the goods are gross substitutes, they're more substitutable than Cobb-Douglas. If I'm able to substitute away from one good and replace it with another, so that's sorry, that's substitutable, substitutable is sigma greater than one. That's the bottom one. Then I did what matters is just my minimum price, which price is the least is which price is lowest. That as the shocks get extreme, I respond only to what is the smallest price. Basically, I'm I can worry about just one thing upstream, which is the thing upstream, it's the price that's smallest. This is kind of, again, this is going back to this idea that this is the first order asymptotic behavior. I can forget about the other higher order things, meaning I can forget about the other sectors. And I just worry when I'm when they're substitutable, I worry about the lowest price. When they're complements, I have to worry about the highest price. And when we're in Cobb-Douglas, we're on this knife edge case right between where I do have to worry about all of them. And so this phi then is a nonlinear function of theta. This is capturing nonlinearity, but it's doing it in a slightly constrained way where we're worried about maxes and mins instead of that full nonlinear recursion. If we were in Cobb-Douglas, it would be linear in theta, and then you would just have, you have the usual nice linear solution. And so that is the, that's the key tool underlying everything. And that is what is, I think, actually like profoundly surprising in this paper is the fact that you get this relatively simple recursion. You can see that this is something we're going to be able to, to analyze. Where does this come from? Just take the original recursion for prices in that first equation and divide by T. If you divide by T, remember Z over T is just theta. I have PI over T on the left. And then if I divide by T here, what I get is something that kind of looks like I'm moving the elast I'm effectively moving the elasticity of substitution. So as T goes to infinity, the exponent in this recursion, so as the scale of the shocks goes to infinity, the exponent in this recursion goes to plus or minus infinity. So the first order behavior says we can worry about just the most extreme price where that depends on the elasticity of substitution on that sigma. And so now to get to this, this question about the mu, so let me show you what GDP does. So remember GDP, we said is just minus beta prime times the prices. And so that's all this is doing. Once you have that result, that lemma, GDP follows trivially. GDP for a given shock is going to converge to minus beta prime times that mu, minus beta prime times that phi of theta times t. Okay, so what's going on here? So the left, these are Taylor series. 
I have the true function for GDP is this solid line. I have a linear approximation in red and a quadratic approximation in black. And that's just, you know, that's the usual thing. We just get this, you know, either a straight line or we get curvature. And part of this demonstrates why a Taylor series doesn't work so well is that a second order approximation when the shocks are really positive actually implies the GDP is falling. And so that's wrong. The right-hand side is this paper. So again, we have GDP here. And the dotted lines are that tail approximation. And so what you're seeing, so what's, what is going on here? So I have some theta, right? And we're thinking about T going to infinity on the right or T, get, T growing on the right. On the left though, so this is, I have plus theta over here. On the left, I flip my theta, right? Remember, it's still T is going to infinity, but I have the opposite value for my theta. So instead of increasing productivity in a given sector, I'm decreasing it now on the left that decreases GDP and I get a different slope for this phi function. The reason I have a non-zero mu is so if this is zero right here, right? If this is zero right here, what you can see is that because the approximation, we're looking at the limit, we're not necessarily gonna intersect with zero. And in fact, this is saying the approximation is wrong. The, the like the, you know, this, that's actually where the errors are largest is at zero. The errors converge to zero, and the why don't you have a different approximation on the right and on the left? You do. So the um, uh, I normalize this so that where these two intersect, like they intersect with each other. But is it like they'll, you know, one way to say this is that you could extend this, both of these lines over and they're going to look like that, right? And they just have, they necessarily have some intersection. So in so on the left, one, is, t, is that t goes to plus infinity or whatever infinity? So in on both sides, t. So so let's so as an example, let's say that we suppose there are two sectors, um, and we're shocking just one sector. So on the right hand side, we're going to say that theta is equal to one zero. On the left hand side, a t cannot be minus infinity. It's theta that changes, right? Correct. And the reason that's important, the reason it's important that it's theta that changes is when we look at this recursion, right? Because what we're thinking okay. about here is, so suppose sigma is less than one. I'm thinking about the max of the phi's. And so if you flip that theta around, you're now flipping the ordering of everything. And so the max is not, you're not just gonna change the sign of the max. So a minus one here does not just, if it was linear, a minus one would just pass straight through with no effect. Because this recursion is nonlinear, when you multiply theta by minus one, you're flipping, you're, you're changing things and you're changing which sector is gonna be that upstream maximum. I'm probably missing something, but if I have a positive shock, I can blow it up to plus infinity. But if I have a negative shock, I cannot, go to minus infinity, you know? If it's a productivity shock, productivity has to remain positive. Good, so these are in logs. I so that's how we're, okay. yeah. So think about we're sending productivity to zero. Okay. Perfect. Wait, can I also ask a question here? Yeah, please. So in principle, um, could I say, so I have a theta that give me a slope for T going to infinity, and then there should be, I, can, I could maybe try to characterize the alternative theta that gives me the same slope for minus infinity. And could I learn something out of that? Would it tell me something about the network as well? Or um, uh, so I can, so there is one place where that happens. Um, so let me show you. Uh, so let me show you a richer version of that figure to help to maybe help see that a little bit. So this is that. So this is a three dimensional version of that same figure. So I was just showing you a slice. What we're now doing here is I have productivity on the you know x and y axes, and then we're plotting GDP on the z axis, on the vertical axis. And so this on the left is some like true nonlinear model, and on the right, what I'm showing you is what the approximation is doing. And so the approximation really here is going to be it's there are two sectors, and so it's going to actually be two planes. It's kind of the it's the minimum actually of two planes. Is the is what this approximation gives you? Just as a you can prove the paper actually derives that. Um, 
where you get, so what you just described, where you get the same slope, that actually occurs a lot in this model. Uh, and actually in every model, it occurs along the diagonal. So because there's constant returns to scale here in this model, when you scale all the shocks, when you scale every productivity up and down, that has purely linear effects. Anything that is- only happen, I see. So it can only happen in this case. Correct. Now, more generally, if you have Cobb Douglas, like you can certainly come up with knife edge conditions where there will be like linear, it'll be linear somewhere. But as a general matter, you're going to get, it's going to be kind of generally nonlinear. Okay. And so the statement that there are linear asymptotes everywhere is really the statement that the right hand side figure is approximating the left when uh, the shocks get large. And so you can see really where does this miss? It misses for small shocks. And actually it misses kind of local to the two shocks being identical. And it does well as the shocks get large. And sorry, and one more question on, on the air. So is there a way to think about um, speed at which the convergence becomes good, bad or good? Or, um, uh, absolutely. So the... Um, the paper spent the the like newer version of the paper spends a lot of time on this. What is going to there's a few things that'll determine that. So one is so like so what makes it fast? So you get fast convergence if uh, the sigmas go to zero or infinity. So if the elasticity of subset so if you look at what we're doing. We are treating this as though either there is zero substitution or infinite substitution. If that is genuinely true, then you get very fast convergence. So if you're literally in a Leontief production function or literally in a linear production function, you converge very fast. Um, uh, or, so the other way that this happens if is if um, inputs are inflexible. So basically I can, what firms are doing when they receive a shock is they are, they can adjust their inputs in response to that, right? The price of some input goes up and I reduce my use of it. If it's hard for me to do that, for me to change my mixture of inputs, which is what Leontief is, if it's hard for me to change my mixture of inputs, that is then also going to make you converge to these asymptotes very quickly. And so those are really the two key forces. And so I, especially with the second one, I, often think of this as being really very much a short-term kind of theory that this is saying, if I shut the, if I, if I tell you, if I, so like, again, thinking back to Europe, if we shut off the natural gas right now, right, the factory is shut down a year from now, two years from now, you have other, there are other power sources, right. And like uh, things come, come online. And so you can actually run the factories again. And so it's really in the short run where it's hard to get to identify new sources of supply for your inputs where these asymptotes are going to be most relevant. You would expect things to kind of smooth out when you have more time. And that's true, not just of energy. You think about like metals. I tell you, you don't have copper anymore. You find something else, you know, but it might take you some time. But this is not convergence in time. This is convergence as uh, the productivity shocks go up, right? Correct. And so one way to say it is that it's, these things are determining how accurate is this approximation for a given level of productivity. So we are talking about a, a large shock at a point in time. Absolutely, absolutely. And so basically convergence is achieved when labor is reallocated to the uh, worst bottlenecks or the most uh, substitute or the most productive uh, sectors if they are substitutes or something like that. Uh, that's, that's what's going to happen. And yeah. then really what's going on here is that there's a limit to how much that helps. There's only so much labor you can reallocate. And at some point that stops working and productivity takes over. And that's why I haven't told you, that's why labor, none of these results depend on what labor is doing. They in fact hold whether labor is flexible or not. You have exactly the same asymptotes, but when labor is more flexible and can reallocate across sectors, you need a bigger shock to reach the same asymptote. Good. And so do we know that you uh, that the allocation as characterized in the lemma as a solution because you know it's the fees depend recursively on the other fees right yeah very good question so this is a um this is a you can show that this is a contraction mm. 
um, just really, but like you're just using, you know, like you could just use, apply the max norm and uh, this is a contraction. And so it's guaranteed to have a solution. That solution is unique and uh, that solution is continuous in theta. And so it's kind of well-behaved in that sense that you, we know that it has to work and being continuous in theta is nice that small movements in productivity don't massively, you know, don't drastically break things that you get a shape that looks like this one on the right. So the slopes can move and it's non-differentiable, but it's still going to be continuous. Um, uh, now, one thing to note about this, about that recursion and about that solution. So again, like this is the true, it's the true thing that we want to solve, right? This is the actual set of equations driving the economy, and I'm approximating that. When we look at these limits in the tail, the exact values of the AIJs do not matter, right? You don't see those anywhere here. What matters, when I'm thinking about sectorized price, what matters is the maximum or the minimum over the inputs that it uses. And what that means is it's really which ones have AIJ greater than zero. That is the only thing that determines this, right? The precise value of the AIJ makes no difference here. All that matters is that it's greater than zero so that, so that I know that sector I is using goods from sector J. So another way to say that is that like kind of the size of a sector and the, the distance between sectors doesn't exactly matter. What matters is the existence of links. Similarly, the exact value of sigma doesn't make any difference, right? Exactly what value this elasticity takes on doesn't matter. What determines the behavior in the tail is simply whether that elasticity is above or below one. So are the input substitutes or are they complements? Once you know that, knowing exactly how substitutable they are, exactly how complementary they are, that does not end up actually mattering. And so the first order behavior in the tail, these, these slopes in the tail, do not depend on the precise values of these parameters, which is great when you're trying to do measurement, because if you think about this, we would need to measure in principle the elasticity of substitution for every single sector across every single good. That is, that's just hopeless, right? We have, we're not even sure what like overall the average elasticity of substitution is. This says you don't need to know the exact values. You don't need to know the exact AIJs. But still, you need to estimate it to figure out whether it's greater than one or smaller than one. Right. You need to know something about it. Absolutely. But, what but you if might I don't know anything is... about it, uh, I have to run regressions to estimate its level, right? I mean, yes. So I yeah, then it's uh, then it's sort of robust to uh, confidence intervals, basically, right? Uh, right. Yes. Yeah. That'd be one way to say it. Is mm -hmm. that it's it's ro it's robust, and so I still need I. You're hundred percent right. I still need to do something but I don't need to worry about totally nailing that parameter. Another way to say it would be that I think there, you know, you could imagine that there might be times where you might be willing to rely a little bit on theory for whether that sigma is above or below one, or I might be willing to extrapolate from like one study to another or from one industry to another where, you know, to know the exact value, I might not be confident in that, but to know the, you know, the value relative to one, I might be willing to, to take some more liberties in calculating that. Um, so what the paper then is building to is trying to think about what is the importance of a single sector, right? So what I want to, again, I want to think about the, uh, the systemic risk associated with the sector. And uh, the way we typically would do that is, again, by looking at the local centrality, which is just the derivative of GDP with respect to productivity in that sector, right? So I do change in GDP over the change in productivity as that, that difference goes to zero. And this is just Halton's theorem. Halton's theorem says that that measure of influence, that derivative is actually equal to the ratio of sectorized sales to total GDP. So what fraction of GDP does the sector account for? In the tail, though, we're going to get something different. So I want to define a tail centrality here as the limit as the shocks get big. And I'm going to think about the left tail centrality. So this is for negative shocks. You could just as well do it for positive shocks. But I'm going to, I'm going to think about as productivity in a sector goes to zero. So as log productivity goes to minus infinity, what happens to GDP? So how does a large shock to sector I affect GDP? GDP. 
Since we said that this phi i function is sector i's response to a shock, if I stack that into a vector, minus beta prime times phi is how GDP responds. And so we have a formula for this, for what in the model determines that tail centrality. So this asymptotic slope, so this is really just the theorem. Given this definition for gamma, we have the gamma is minus beta prime times that phi, where the phi again comes from that recursion. And I'm, in, I'm looking at just a negative shock to this one sector. And I want to know how does that propagate and what does that do to GDP? We can characterize that. So one way to do it is actually just to look at a, um, to look at some graphs. So these are the, I don't know, when you write a network paper, you make these network kind of graphs. So I'm thinking about shocks to these red sectors, the single dark red sector in each network. So we're shocking that sector. I'm assuming in general that the elasticities of substitution are less than one. There is, you know, there's data on that. Typically we estimate elasticities less than one in the data. Certainly not all of them are less than one, but just for the, you know, this, for the sake of these examples, that's what we're going to do. The arrows are flows of goods. So the idea is that in this first figure, this shocked sector sells goods in these directions, right? And it also buys goods from other sectors, right? So it buys goods from that same, I could call it sector two here. Sector one buys goods from sector two, the shocked sector. The red arrows are showing you how the shocks propagate. When I hit sector I, shocks propagate downstream and they're affecting, in this first case, just these two downstream sectors. The uh, next figure, figure B, all that I did is add one extra arrow where now call this like sector three here, sector three buys from sector two. So I've added one link in the production network, but now it has put everybody downstream of the sector that got shocked. Now everybody's downstream, so the shock is going to propagate more strongly, have a larger impact on GDP. And so what is going to matter in this model, again, is who's downstream of you. So I shock one sector, who is downstream of you. On the, in the middle, more sectors are downstream than on the left. The right-hand figure looks at what happens when we change the elasticity of substitution. So in general, we're thinking about elasticities greater than one. What happens if there's an elasticity less than one? The shock basically doesn't, a negative shock does not propagate through that sector. Why not? Because that's now the minimum productivity or it's going to be the maximum price. And so this one, when I'm looking at its price, it's going to be equal to actually the min of the upstream prices, right? Which is going to be that guy. So I shock again this red sector, it's a negative shock, shocks downstream, but only downstream, or it propagates downstream, but only downstream through sectors that are not able to substitute. When the elasticity is greater than one, what they do is they substitute away and they just get all of their output from the top right. And that's one way of seeing kind of visually what is this, what is the math doing? It's thinking about for every sector, if your sigma is less than one, what is the highest price? The highest price is going to be the one that has the negative shock for that guy. If your sigma is greater than one, you're looking for your lowest price because you can substitute. So you buy the cheap input. That's the one that got no shock. So they're still okay. So what do we get? So again, the uh, tail centrality for a sector is going to be minus beta prime times phi for phi evaluated at this theta that's only shocking that one sector. So what does that mean? This tail centrality, the importance of a sector is going to go up when substitutability goes down. When sigma goes from greater than one to less than one for any sector that is downstream of the sector that I'm shocking. Another way to say that is that when people cannot substitute away from you, if you produce something that does not have substitutes, you are systemically more important, right? That sounds right. Sounds like it should be true. And this is formalizing that idea. So that's number one. 
that substitutability stops negative shocks. That's what you're seeing here. Number two, when the sigma, set... sigma is the same across inputs, right? It's a it's a homothetic CS production function. Uh, yes, you can. You can, the paper talks about this that you can kind of elaborate on this model a little bit to uh, to use it to think about the sigma being a property of a good instead of a, a, a sector. One way to think about this is you can imagine that, say, like, you can take copper. There are some things where you have to use copper, right? So, like, uh, in the U.S., if you're building houses, you kind of have to, you have to have copper wiring, right? But in other, like, in other settings, you don't necessarily need copper wiring, right? You can use aluminum wiring. You can use other metals. And right, so, for some right. things, if you're... If you're in residential construction, you cannot substitute away from copper. If you're doing other types of wiring, you're building computers maybe, it doesn't necessarily need to be copper. Right, but in a given sector, the only thing that matters asymptotically if sigma is less than one is the input with the worst uh, increase in price, right? Uh, Correct. Which is itself endogenous, but you know. But. Whereas if you didn't have the CS structure, you could be that at the same time, uh, one input, which is loosely speaking, complement would matter, but also another input, which is loosely speaking, substitute could matter at two, right? Um, um, conceivably. So the paper, uh, so, at, so certainly there is a... You see what I mean by construction at the sector level, at each sector level, there is one input that dominates all the others as far as the cost, uh, the asymptotic cost is concerned. Right, and that's, I, I fully agree, that is coming out of CES. The, uh, the paper talks about, there's an appendix that talks about how could you potentially generalize this away from CES. And uh, you're gonna, you will not necessarily get the same result. You'll, the paper sh says, Kind of what do you need to get a result of this form, like this sort of recursion? But you may get a, it may look somewhat different. Um, you know, one way to say that, to kind of restate, or like one, I think one version of the concern that you're raising is that you could imagine that maybe when the shocks get really big, the firm can switch or the sector can switch technologies, right? Maybe they have multiple production technologies and that would then change these results. And so that's, again, why I think about this as a uh, kind of a short run sort of theory, that this is about what happens to you if you have, you have a production technology, you have something you do, and I give you a massive shock to your prices, to the prices of your inputs, effectively. And uh, if you get a crazy shock to your prices, you might eventually change how you produce, right? And just use a different technology. And then that's, you can think of that as a form of substitution, right? And so in the longer run, I might expect the elasticities kind of effectively become larger as I as I have more time to substitute in various ways. Um, uh, so the other thing that we have, the other comparative static, is that when the set of inputs used by sector J grows, the tail centrality is going to increase for anybody upstream when the elasticities are the tail centrality is going to be greater when the elasticities are less than one. And so this is again showing that that when I add a link, when I have a new link in panel B, that makes this shock propagate more. And again, because we have sigma less than one for everything here. Okay, so I'm uh, quickly running out of time. And so let me, um, so like, like so where am I? So I because you said there's like questions after we've been doing questions well, as we I, go. I, so how do you want me to handle that? I don't know. Let's say, I mean, you can take your time to finish. I don't know, you can use five to ten minutes to finish. And then if there's one or two more questions, we'll just take those and then we will stop there, I guess. Okay, perfect. Yep, I can I can absolutely do that. So um five or ten minutes, perfect. So let me show you um one example. It was just to like one that you can solve. So you can sometimes solve this analytically. One example is suppose I have a fully connected network. So every sector uses goods from every other sector and all the goods are complements. So the elasticities are all less than one. I don't need to know exactly the value of the sigma. I don't need to know exactly what those AIJs are. We're just saying every AIJ is greater than zero and every sigma I is less than one. 
your local approximation, we would have this, this, this is your Leon TF inverse. So this is just a linear function of Z, right? It's just a beta prime times a matrix times Z. The tail approximation, what it's going to say is the GDP is going to converge to beta prime times Z. So the consumption weights times the productivities plus a little added multiplier on the worst of your productivities. So the lowest log productivity. So what does this tell us? It says the GDP depends on, as kind of this extra weight on the worst shock. What does it do? One, it generates asymmetry. You can see where the asymmetry is coming from, which is that there's a special role played by the minimum, right? That this is gonna create some negative skewness because if, if I get more dispersion in my shocks, the higher maximum doesn't really help me. The higher minimum though, is, or the, the more negative minimum is going to hurt me. That is gonna hurt the economy because you're loading up on what is the weakest of your inputs through this nonlinearity. Another way to say that is that the worst sector is not granular on average, right? I don't know which one is gonna be the worst sector and it's gonna change depending on, on what the shock is. The worst sector is conditionally granular, which is to say that it becomes important to, precisely because it got a large negative shock. And that's gonna change depending on what the shock is. That we didn't think of semiconductors as being a huge deal until we got a big negative shock to semiconductors. Right, And when we have a lot of natural gas, you're not worried about shocks to natural gas. When you don't have any natural gas, when the, when the pipes get shut off, then all of a sudden you do worry about every marginal shock to natural gas. And so the, the importance the tail, of a sector yeah. is, is endogenous here. The tail of GDP cannot be fatter than the tail of T. Of, um, wonderful. So... Um, some of that was taken out of the most the like fight the most recent version of the paper. There was an earlier version um, that, that you probably saw that that works that out that works out the tail of GDP. And you're one hundred percent right. The tail of GDP is going to inherit the um, uh, the shape of the tails of the individual sector. Let's is that right? It's going to inherit the sh it's going to inherit the shape but not necessarily the scale, which it is to say that it's like where e units have idiosyncratic shocks and they aggregate uh, into aggregate fluctuations, basically. Uh, there, there are examples where local interactions imply that the aggregate as a fat, uh, aggregate GDP has a fatter tail than and the shocks that, that hit. The, Good. So what this is going to do is it's going to make aggregate, even though there is diversification, right? You can have many shocks. The tail of GDP is going to have, you can see, well, I mean, it's going to, the tail of GDP is going to have the same, you know, magnitude, right? Like exponential magnitude or however you want to. I mean, this, is a, this is a static model with a frozen distribution of productivity shocks and you just, you know, magnify it through team, basically, right? Right. But we as can, there are models where when a unit has a, has a draw of the idiosyncratic shock, it won't be the same draw next period, and its draw affects the downstream and upstream industries. You can do some of that. So the, some of that models. is in the, Yeah, I mean, so th these are these are great. This is I that aspect of things, thinking about the tail of GDP, I think is super, super interesting. I don't have anything in these slides on it because that's a bit, it's a heavy lift mm -hmm. to do that carefully. So it's the paper did it. Um, and there's still a little bit of that left in the paper, but it's, there's, we have to add, we have to do work. Um, but it's, I'd be, I'd be happy to talk about it. Um, but it's, it's, it, it's, I don't have time for it at the moment. Um, one thing that you can see here, I kind of, I think going down this, this, this line that you're thinking about is that when I add a new shock, I'm gonna make the tail of GDP heavier, right? If I add a new sector, a new good, right? Every time I introduce a new good, I might diversify the economy locally because I have more shocks, right? And so I'm averaging across more things, but now there's more opportunities for that minimum to be bad. And so you can really shrink the volatility of GDP locally, but at the same time, the tail actually might get heavier in some sense when we have more, more new goods. Um, so let me quickly just show you how you might go about measuring this in the data. So what do we need in the data? I'm going to assume that all the sigmas are less than one. That is absolutely wrong, obviously wrong. I'm gonna do that just to, 
to make this feasible because we can't estimate every sigma. The AIJs, again, remember, I don't need the ex exact value. I just need to know which sector is buying from which other sectors, right? I need to know the set of their inputs. I'm going to get that from the uh, most recent input output tables from the from the, the US. This is then plotting that tail centrality on the vertical axis against the sales share on the horizontal axis. And it's kind of calling out the, the top, the top sectors by tail centrality and sales share. So what do we get? Hospitals, again, huge in terms of sales share. They're the biggest single sector. Don't, mat don't matter much in terms of tail centrality. Actually, the amount that they measure ju is just exactly their sales. That they, uh, their impact on GDP comes purely through the product that they sell itself. There's nothing downstream. Oil matters a lot because it's used to produce energy, which is upstream of everything. Electricity has the single highest tail centrality because it's an input to literally everything. What's interesting to me is the other ones that show up. So we get truck transportation. Why? Because all the goods are getting transported by trucks, right? And everybody ends up needing truck transportation in order to produce their output. Credit intermediation, right? We have tons of work on the importance of, of financial intermediation. That is showing up here because if you think about it, everybody is using banking services. You shut down banking services, you shut down the economy. So it's natural that that would show up here. We also get legal services. Why are legal services showing up? Again, every sector buys legal services. The way I think about this is that we observe them in the data paying for lawyers, but really what that's showing is simply that everybody is benefiting from the legal system broadly, right? That we need property rights, we need patents, we need the ability to, you know, actually trust that somebody's going to pay you and honor a contract. And that's... So if you had a, a Cosa Nostra extortion business, uh, assuming everybody pays it, it would show up as having a high tail centrality. Uh, that does um, not mean it's needed, no? I mean, there is this assumption that everything which is paid for is uh, a productive input, right? And if... Legal services are a zero sum game. Uh, then, then, you know, uh, I have legal services because you have legal services. Uh, yes, um, no, this is great. entirely, uh, GDP would go up by a lot. Right? Yes, no, I, so uh, yeah, I, this is that it's a fantastic point. I like, so my wife is a lawyer, and so I will tell her that um, you compared her to the mob. Um, mm -hmm. She will enjoy that. Um, she, I, I look, I, I'm totally, and in fact, I think she would be uh, sympathetic to this view that a lot of legal services are maybe zero sum and may represent a tax, right? So another way to think about it is taxes, right? Everybody pays taxes and maybe we don't think of them as a necessary input. Um, the way I would look, and so, you know, look, another one that shows up here that I did not label, but that's very high is advertising. Everybody pays for advertising and it's not clear that that, how important that is. And if you shut down advertising, do you shut down GDP? And so I think part of what you're pointing at is that I've made the assumption that Sigma is less than one for everything and that we need all the inputs. And for some of these inputs, that's not going to be right. And I'm totally open to the view that for legal services, it might not be right. I would push back on that in the sense that I think we need the legal system. So lawyers, I, lawyers, I, you know, I, there's an argument that we don't need them. You know, we probably need the police and like judges, and we need some form of dispute resolution and contract enforcement and property right enforcement. And I view this, this in the data, what we are observing is people paying for lawyers. And that kind of just, it's a way of just measuring that they all are using the legal system, broadly speaking. But I agree, like Cosa Nostra, right. if they're not providing services, then it's just a tax and that's not productive. I can comment on the legal services. That's maybe where the interpretation as short run, long run gets a little bit more difficult, right? Because oh yeah, absolutely. I, and I don't want to, uh, talking about short run, uh, I don't want to interrupt you, but maybe you should try to wrap up soon. Yes, please. So um, 100%, so that, so that was I said. Those were that was that was what I wanted to cover. So the what we're doing here is trying to think about the first order description of the tail behavior of a model. Sectors are important when a lot of GDP is downstream and when they have no substitutes. And so that's what this is getting at: is how much of GDP is downstream of you. And then you can ask: Are there substitutes for these things? Are there substitutes for electricity? Are there substitutes for truck transportation? Maybe. Maybe you use trains, right? And so that 
that is really the, that's what this, this paper shows is those are the things that you need to measure. You need those sigmas and you need to know the structure of the network. New universal inputs. So computers, they may raise productivity, but they can create tail risk of their own, right? Because now if I lose computers, that's potentially very significantly destructive for GDP. This lets us then think about optimal shutdowns, what's an essential sector. And it's a lot of this is, I think, intuitive. And I think like you guys are pointing at very intuitive and, and natural points. And this helps to formalize it and think about what would we need to measure to resolve these questions, right? To resolve whether legal services are important. We This tells us what we would need to know. Okay, and so thanks again. Thank you for these questions and comments there. They've been, they've been wonderful and I, I appreciate your time. Thanks a lot for your presentation. So we would have time for one or two more questions. I mean, there were already quite a few questions during your presentation, but it, I mean, if someone has additional questions, that would be a good time. It's it's a very, very general question. So I'm not sure it's very useful, but just to, to think about it. So what, what could, so it, it's kind of, uh, so the model is static. So in a way it can be seen as a long run, I think, uh, as giving some long run effects. So could we gain anything from, I mean, could it truly really gain anything from adding some sluggishness in the adjustment in that kind of framework? Um, so, so sluggishness of adjustment is going to make these, and the paper actually works through this. There's a figure that shows this. Um, and it like it actually it works it, it works through it analytically. So you can kind of solve this in like a sort of quasi-dynamic way, like there's a little cheating. What it what it kind of lets you see is how that basically the uh, these asymptotes are going to matter more on the impact of the shock. And then as you adjust, because like again, if you think about it economically, like what's a firm doing? If I tell you all of a sudden that some input is really expensive. And like the way we, the, what we know about supply chains is that it's not easy in the short run to change your supplier, right? You have relationships, you have contracts and you go tell somebody I need, you know, 10,000 kilograms of copper and they won't just give it to you overnight, right? They're going to say this takes time. Whereas if you have a continuing relationship, then that'll, that can come. And so the, uh, when you add dynamics, what you, what this, what it kind of shows you is that these effects the effects that are kind of isolated here matter a lot on the impact of the shock, and they're going to get attenuated as you can start to adjust. And the model then shows you what is the adjustment that you should expect. And that's useful for policymakers for saying, okay, well, what do we need to actually promote, right? Like, what do we want to do? We need to, like, why is flexibility beneficial? That should actually raise GDP precisely because you can respond endogenously to, to shocks. That we actually want I mean, this was a question during COVID, right? Of like the the American versus European response to a lot of this of do we want to protect jobs or workers? And uh, one of the concerns was that when you protect jobs, you're limiting these these in, this endogenous substitution, and that might ultimately be bad. All right, thank you. Right, thanks. Any other questions? So I think we can stop there. So really, thanks a lot for. Uh, for coming, for presenting, and for this, uh, the presentation was really great. Um, uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, thanks, everyone. And let's stop there. Bye. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye and thank you so much. Very intriguing, very fascinating paper. Yeah, okay. it's wonderful. It was great to meet you yeah. guys. Um, I again really appreciate <laughs> really appreciate the award and, it, and like the especially chance to when. Uh, it's it's a way to 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 deal with the supply chain risk in a very systematic matter manner, which is very very nice and helpful even for insurers because we have not to think on a risk being isolated but in connection with other risks. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, I mean it's amazing how important these things have turned yes. like these supply chain risks have really turned out to be in a way that I feel like we maybe did not understand a few years ago. Exactly. Right. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Thank bye. you very much. Bye.